to talk about worries, waistline, and weight in women, insights and implications of the hormone restoration model. Okay, I would say at least once a week, I hear from a female patient, I weigh more now than I weighed when I was pregnant with my last child. And these patients are not pregnant. And this is just very damaging and daunting to a woman's self-esteem. And I had a patient say not too long ago, I don't understand it, Dr. Stevenson, my 17-year-old stepdaughter and I weigh the same. She looks like this and I look like this. What's happening to me? And there are body composition changes as women go through transitions and related to their hormone levels. And so let's look at a couple of phenotypes. This is what we call gynoid obesity, where there's increased weight distribution in the hip and thigh area. When I look at hormone levels in these patients, they tend to have high estrogen, low progesterone. And this may come on after pregnancy. It is also associated with uterine fibroids and breast cancer risk, this type of phenotype. The next is what we call an android obesity. These are the women that say to me, I've always been able to wear uh, a belt. I've always been able to stuff in my shirt. I don't understand. My waistline is disappearing. It's the increased uh, deposition of fat in the mid body. And when we talk about body composition in women, if that waist circumference is 35 inches or greater, she has an increased risk of heart disease and stroke, as well as cancer and dementia. And this is a real easy little stress test you can do yourself at home, pull your tape measure out of your toolbox or your sewing kit, and if your waistline is 35 inches, you want to do something about that, get that below the 35 inch mark. When I test uh, levels in women, I see higher testosterone and DHEA levels, normal or low estrogen levels, and low progesterone levels with this type of phenotype. We see this, this body composition change as women go through the perimenopausal transition and in their postmenopausal years. And we see an association with diseases such as metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, and hypertriglyceridemia, as well as the cardiovascular disease that I mentioned earlier. There's also a non-obese hyperandrogenism. I tend to see this in younger females, females with PCOS, with the female athlete triad, with eating disorders, with mood disorders. And they also, when I measure their hormone levels, have high testosterone, high DHEA, which are the androgens, and then normal or low estrogen and low progesterone. And so if you see the pattern here, what did all three phenotypes have in common? Low progesterone. I would say progesterone is my most common prescription when it comes to hormone supplementation in female patients. Worries in women will also impact their health. So maybe I'll, I'll see a patient and she's not so much concerned about her weight, but she has a lot of worries. She has a very high social burden. And what a woman is feeling and thinking impacts her health. It impacts her cardiovascular system. It impacts her stress response. And research studies have shown us that when women are depressed or anxious, they have elevated inflammatory and clotting factors. This is going to lead to that cardiovascular disease risk. They also have abnormal cortisol patterns. And I'm going to show you some cortisol patterns in the case histories a little bit later in this segment of the presentation. Women that have experienced childhood abuse or trauma have changes in the pathways that go from the brain to the adrenal glands to the blood vessels that lead to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Women with high hostility ratings also are at risk of cardiovascular disease. Now when I say hostility or hostile woman, you probably have an idea in your head as to what that might be. But in the psychological literature, the way that we define hostility or a high hostility rating is a woman who has a negative orientation towards the world. She perceives the actions of others to be exploitative or manipulative. She has difficulties estab establishing relationships of trust. Most of the time, her looming consciousness, that is the voice inside her head, that chatter, 
in, in, in the head, or the monkey mind, which you'll hear about from the yoga ladies later, is feelings of guilt, resentment, frustration, anger that they can't express. I'm not good enough. They don't really mean that when they get a compliment. Just this type of, of negative think that goes on most of the time. When women are in that sort of state, they have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease because there are changes in the blood vessel related to release of, of uh, hormones and inflammatory factors. And then finally, women with chronic unresolved psychological stress have accelerated aging, and they also have changes in inflammatory factors. I'll give you uh, two examples of this. In the United States, we have 44 million unpaid caregivers. Those are 85% women that are taking care of a loved one, a family member who has a terminal or a chronic illness. And that means managing their doctor's visits and their medications, maybe helping with their personal hygiene and all their personal needs. And the caregivers are, are, do, are um, fulfilling this role on top of caring for their own families, raising their children, holding down a job, uh, volunteering in the community, being involved in their church. So it's a very high social burden. And the research shows that within six weeks of assuming caregiver status, this is an added stress, that women have changes in immune function. Their natural killer cells drop. Their T cell and B cell response is more sluggish. And they have elevated inflammatory factors. And I'm sure that you've all seen a situation where the caregiver's health becomes more seriously compromised than the, the patient that they're taking care of. And so when I am giving a diagnosis of dementia or cancer, I'm also talking to that caregiver about getting support because their health will suffer as well as the patient's health through this process. Now, I'm not saying women shouldn't assume that role. It's a very fulfilling role for many women, but it's also very demanding emotionally and physically. Another situation of chronic unresolved psychological stress are women who mother special needs children. And they did a study a couple of years ago where the women were all uh, age matched as far as their chronological age. But half of the women had special needs children and half of the women had normal children. And I'm very blessed to have normal children, I, which to me is quite tough and I cannot imagine the challenges of taking care of special needs children. But when they looked at telomere length, which is a measure of aging at the cellular level, they found that the women of the special needs children were on average five to 17 years older than their chronological age. So there is definite wear and tear. And women in those situations, it's all the more important that they achieve hormone balance, that they engage in activities such as yoga and music and that mind-body-spirit connection to nurture their health. So sex steroids and steroid hormones are involved not just with the sexual response or uh, bone density, which I know you hear a lot about the osteoporosis, but also with a sense of vitality, uh, musculoskeletal pathways, not just hot flashes and mood, but also thinking, intellectual sharpness, crispness, cognition, the body composition that we've talked about. This is certainly not an exhaustive list, but any of my patients with any of these disorders, I want to know her hormone status. I want to get a hormone profile on her because I may be able to minimize the manifestation of these chronic illnesses or decrease the number of exacerbations or flares of these illnesses or maybe even decrease the number of prescription medicines that she's taking for management if I test her hormone levels and, for instance, find that she's low in progesterone and start the progesterone supplementation, I find a response as it relates to these chronic disease states, migraine headaches, seizure disorders, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, asthma, skin disorders, 
uh, arrhythmias, ir irregular heartbeats, irritable bowel syndrome, connective tissue diseases such as sarcoidosis, rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm going to show you some examples of these in case history. So if you have anything on these lists, you need a hormone profile. So these are some symptoms of hormone changes. We talked about bloating and headaches, mood. You can have irregular menses associated with hormone uh, imbalances, changes with cholesterol and triglycerides, difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep or achieving a restful sleep, unexplained fatigue, tender breast, cognitive changes. I have patients tell me I never have to write down numbers. Now I cannot remember numbers. I've never had trouble balancing my checkbook and I can't seem to focus and balance my checkbook anymore. Difficulty with intellectual clarity and crispness and sharpness that, that they've noticed. Uh, sugar cravings, food cravings, weight gain, decreased stamina. I've had marathon runners come in and say, I just can't run anymore. And I check their hormone levels and you know, they're uh, in the gutter. And once we replace their levels to normal, then they are able to regain the stamina. I also do not like it when a doctor tells a woman, well, that's just part of being old or you're just getting old, when the woman notices a change in her body and the response is, well, that's just aging. Well, it's not just aging. If a woman had a lot of vitality and energy and stamina in her 20s and 30s, then she should have that in her 40s and 50s and 60s. It may decline just a little bit, but not profoundly. Cold intolerance or these temperature changes, palpitations, constipation, unexplained aches and pains. So let's talk a little bit about how when women are stressed, it affects what they eat, and what they eat affects how they feel. So what sort of foods do women go for when they are stressed and need to be comforted? Well, in, in Texas, everything is a Coke. You know, whether it's a, a Pepsi or a Sprite, it's, we call it a Coke. You know, so the soda with the carbonation and the sugar and the caffeine kick. And then, of course, the chocolate something sweet and high in fat, and then something salty and high in fat. Because our brains like salt and sugar and fat. When we gorge on something like that, it activates the pleasure center in the brain. And this goes back to the Stone Angers. When uh, humans were in the Stone Age, you know, they didn't encounter bluebell ice cream <laughs> and potato chips. Uh, they had to forage for their food, they had to hunt, they had to gather. But if they did run up on something salty or sugary or um, high in fat, they tended to gorge on that. Their, the brain liked it. And so our saliva glands, our taste receptors, and our brains are really hardwired to, when we encounter something like this, eat as much as we can because we don't know when we're going to encounter it again. Now, 10,000 years later, we can easily have access to salt and sugar and fat. And so our challenge is how to minimize that and that influence. They're, they looked at a, a couple of things as it related to gender and comfort food. And one of the interesting studies I found is that attitudes affect consumption and gender affects food preferences. So for the males, what sort of comfort foods do you think the males liked? They liked hot, hearty foods. So pizza, steak, potatoes, casseroles, hearty stews. You know, that's what they went for when they wanted to be comforted. And they tended to go for the comfort foods when they were celebrating something. Okay, so winning a game, getting a promotion, something good happening is when the guys tended to go for the comfort foods. Now, for the females, what sort of foods do they prefer? pastries, chips, ice cream, candy, things that you don't have to prepare, things that you can just pull out of the pantry or freezer and eat, right? Because who's making all that stuff for the guys? And you know, if we're feeling bad and exhausted, you know, just pull out the raw chocolate chip cookie dough. I mean, don't even bother slicing it and put it in the oven, right? So those were the types of foods that women tended to prefer. And when did women go for the comfort food? When they're feeling down, depressed, frustrated, anxious, that's when they tend to eat more of the comfort food. 
experience. And like we talked about at the beginning of the talk, a lot of women spend a lot of time feeling guilty in that negative realm. Now, these are some of the comfort foods that my patients eat down in Texas. We have a book club called the Pulpwood Queens, and they get together once a month, and these are some of their recipes. Um, this is called my truly scrumptious chocolate present. So you take a thawed pastry sheet, put that on a cookie sheet, you pile it with snack-sized Snickers, you gather up the edges like a bag and twist the top, brush it with butter, bake it in the oven until brown. And meanwhile, you're melting your Milky Ways in the microwave for the frosting, and then you serve this with vanilla bluebell ice cream. Now, these women really need progesterone, you know. Again, uh, uh, I actually made this recipe, and this is what it looks like. And everybody knows where Bluebell comes from, right? That's from Texas. Best ice cream in the world. And I could only eat one bite of this. But my husband and my 16-year-old daughter, they finished it off. Now, uh, they're not just eating, they're also drinking. And these are the East Texas martinis. You take an assorted uh, tropical popsicle box, assorted flavors of vodka, you choose your popsicle and your vodka, you unwrap the popsicle, put it in a pink plastic cup, pour in two shots of vodka over the popsicle, and dip and suck. And, um, my patients tell me that the best combination is the mango popsicle with the orange gray goose vodka. And um, so this is how it looks. And I was able to finish this. But alcohol stimulates the GABA receptors in, in the brain. And the GABA receptors have a calming, sedating effect on mood. Well, guess what else goes to the GABA receptors in the brain? Progesterone. And what I do see in women as they go through the perimenopausal transition, they are drinking more. And they say, yeah, I used to have a glass of wine occasionally, now it's every night. Or I used to have a glass of wine with dinner. I can't calm down. I've got to have a couple of glasses. I saw a patient last week, she's drinking a bottle of wine a night because she, she just can't seem to calm down. They're exhausted, but yet they can't rest. You know, they, the brains are going, they're ruminating, they have a lot of anxiety. And so I, I do get uh, histories from my patients are, have you found that you crave more alcohol or drink more alcohol? And uh, then I find that their progesterone is low and they're able to get better control if we achieve hormone balance. So the sex hormones in women's health, they affect the brain, activity that has to do with mood, behavior, sexual responsiveness, appetite, and pain. They are involved in the body, in pain pathways, and inflammation. And uh, as it relates to the nervous system, the musculoskeletal system, the immune system, we have hormone receptors in the heart. The uh, hormones are active as it relates to opening the blood vessels and protecting against rhythm disturbances and dysfunctions in the heart vessels. And then they're involved in metabolism. Uh, glucose insulin interactions. This is where some of the, the sugar cravings come in. Let's ask you a little bit about your health worries here. So we're going to take a little poll and I want you to be honest with yourself and honest with me. What is your greatest health worry? What is your greatest health fear as it relates to your personal health? How many of you would say it's dementia, getting dementia? Okay, so we've got quite a few hands on that one. How many would say cardiovascular disease? This would be heart attack and stroke. I would say more hands for that. All right, and then what about breast cancer? There's quite a few hands up th with this one. And what about something else? Anybody, there's some, another disease that's their greatest health fear? Okay. So what are women more likely to suffer from from these three choices? The leading cause of death and disability in North American women is cardiovascular disease. And so odds are that would be the one that you would suffer from and the one that you want to prevent. Of course, you want to prevent all of them, but your highest priority would be perhaps preventing the one that you're more likely to incur. So in the hormone restoration clinical model, 
The patient comes in with symptoms. She undergoes testing for an accurate assessment of her hormones. And then there's precise prescribing of individualized doses of bioidentical hormones along with nutritional lifestyle counseling. And then the hormone levels are monitored to remain in a physiologic range. And this model of care is available at the pharmacies that are sponsoring this event today. They have the hormone test kits. They have the hormone questionnaires. And I'm sure that you have a pharmacy, a pharmacy in your community where they do offer the hormone consultations. Uh, Georgie McNeil is right here in Wolfville. And then there are also some in Bridgeton with Kirk. And you can find out more at the tables here about how to get your hormones tested. But I would encourage every woman in this room to know her personal hormone profile. And if her regimen, nutrition, lifestyle, diet, and hormones is, is appropriate for her and her needs. So here she's asking, has anyone seen my hormones? Where do we look for the hormones? Well, where I look is in the saliva. Now, I was certainly trained to do serum testing but I was continually frustrated by serum testing because serum testing is not an accurate reflection of hormone levels unless that patient has a tumor with, that's secreting high, high levels of hormones. You're just not going to capture these subtle changes in the hormones that manifest as severe symptoms in midlife women with serum testing. And every day I see a patient who tells me, well, my doctor did blood tests and everything came back normal, so it's not my hormones. And I say, you haven't had your hormones tested appropriately or accurately. You've got to have the saliva test. The saliva test tells me what's going on in the tissue. And that's what I care about. I want to know what's happening in the brain, what's happening in the heart, what's happening in the breast, what ha what's happening in the immune system. The hormones pass very transiently through the bloodstream. And so just finding out what's going on in the blood at one point in time is, is not helpful. Whereas gleaning this information from the saliva as uh, the hormones pass through the salivary gland into the saliva, I see very good concordance between what the patient reports, what I suspect based on my history and physical exam, and the resulting hormone profile. And this is just comparing and contrasting the saliva to the serum or to FSH. If you've had an FSH test and your doctor has told you your hormones are normal based on an FSH, that's not an adequate evaluation nor appropriate evaluation. It's, it's quite insufficient to categorize women as to where they are in the perimenopausal transition. So you need to have the saliva test. The, uh, there are advantages with this model of care. We see a low incidence of side effects you get individualized dosing, so it's not just choosing from three or four pills and handing it to a patient. I write a prescription that is specific for her and her needs. The compounding pharmacist can make up any possible combination. And the physiologic effects will mimic those of, the of, of hormones that are released from the ovaries. I've used the creams going through the skin, transdermal is the preferred route of delivery. And speaking of that, that made me think of Robin McGraw. How many of y'all have heard about the hormones lately on the Oprah show, on Dr. Phil, on Robin, with Robin McGraw? Great. I'm so excited about that information that's being shared. And I just loved Robin's testimony about how she went to the doctor and the doctor handed her all those prescriptions for the antidepressants and for the synthetic hormones and how she said no. I'm not taking this, I'm gonna do my own research, I'm gonna take control of my health, and I'm gonna find out what's right for me. Okay, so we have the patient and the pharmacist and the physician or healthcare professional all communicating together with the hormone restoration model triad. And because progesterone is the most common prescription that I write, we did a study of progesterone only in postmenopausal women in 2004, looking at these clotting and inflammatory factors. Because again, there's a lot of misinformation, even in the medical community, about the natural hormones. The North American Menopause Society had come out and made the statement that we should conclude that the same risk as were demonstrated in the WHI with Provera 
would apply to progesterone. There's no evidence to support that statement, yet they made the claim. We refuted that with this study and published it in 2004 in Blood Journal. Do women just need progesterone? No. Some need DHEA, some need estrogen, some need testosterone. And so we followed that study with a three-year clinical trial looking at compounded hormones in women ages 30 to 70. We have 150 women enrolled in this clinical trial. And thus, and women come from all over the state of Texas and even from other states to participate in this research study. Now, I don't have the other states on here because they wouldn't fit. Texas is too big. But uh, this is where we are. We're east of Dallas, for those of you that uh, are interested. And this is what we're finding with the transdermal plant-derived compounded hormones, a decrease in blood pressure, decrease in fibrocystic changes of the breast, decrease in blood sugar, decrease in depression and anxiety, decrease in pain, decrease in triglyceride levels, decrease in inflammation and clotting factors, and a decrease in hormone-related symptoms. We published our initial analysis in 2007 in Circulation, a journal of the American Heart Association. We have another publication in ATVB in 2008. And, you know, so when your doctor tells you there's no studies about this, the answer is yes, there are. And the pharmacies have copies of my papers. They make them available to the physicians in this area. And in 2008, November, we published this paper, Compounded Transdermal Hormone Therapy Effects on Hemostatic Immunologic Factors Peri and Postmenopausal Women. The acceptance rate for these papers is about 13%. And there are tens of thousands of papers that are submitted. So I just want you to have an idea about the quality of the research that we're doing. And we were not only encouraged in that our paper was accepted, but we were one of 32 papers from over 4,000 selected for a news release. It's a tremendous honor. And I did interviews with WebMD, Medscape, Family Practice News, Cardiology News, OBGYN News, UK Reader's Digest. Uh, you can go to my website, uh, I think, did everybody get the bookmarks? I brought some bookmarks that have my website. They're on the book table. And you can see printouts of these, or you can get them from the pharmacies. So let's put this together with a couple of case histories, and then we're going to have some time for some questions and answers. It's not important that you read all the words and all of these slides. I'm going to hit the high points. But I do have over 60 case histories in my book of women of different ages and stages. So if you want to get that and, and read more detail, uh, you're certainly able to do so. So this patient comes in, she's 32. Well, that's too, too young to have a hormone issue, isn't it? No. All right, 32. She's got weight gain, joint pain. She has a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. She's been on Topamax, Methotrexate, Remicade, stopped all of these because of side effects. She's been given an oral contraceptive because she has irregular menses. She's got fatigue, poor sleep quality, and worsening PMS. And of course, her physician had told her that she doesn't have any hormone problems. Okay, so she's taking, uh, past, past medical history, she's taking her contraceptive. She's had two pregnancies, two deliveries at age 19 and 22. She breastfed the babies. She's had her gallbladder out. She's had a tubal ligation, a family history of high blood pressure. She's got a high school education, lives with her husband, two kids, a dog and a fish, married 14 years, works as a secretary, watches about three hours of TV a day, volunteers about eight hours a week, and does not exercise. She's eating a soccer mom diet, driving her kids around, drinking four or five sodas a day. She says, I'm too tired to exercise or cook. And you say, why do you ask all these questions? Well, I ask all these questions because they are relevant to the patient and her health. A study in the Journal of American Medical Association a couple of years ago talked about television watching in midlife women, and they followed a group of midlife women for seven years. And they found that the single most important activity that predicted their development of insulin resistance, diabetes, and obesity was how much television they watched. And starting at seven hours a week, there was a direct correlation with the development of those problems. Now, how does watching the TV affect your blood sugar? 
What do you do when you watch TV? Right. And what do we tend to eat? Comfort foods, right? Okay. So on her physical exam, uh, she's obese. This is a measurement of obesity. Her blood pressure, she's pre-hypertensive, according to the American Heart Association. The waist circumference, look at that, 41 inches. Definitely higher than we want her to be. Remember, it should be 35 inches or less. She's got an enlarged thyroid. She's got fibrocystic changes in her breast. Her hands and feet are cool. She's got the psoriasis, changes in her scalp hair. Her, uh, these are just mood scores that I do as far as depression and anxiety. On her lab imaging, her thyroid functions are abnormal, so she's got a thyroid problem. Her triglycerides are high. These are inflammatory factors that are high. Her blood sugar is high. And I know you all have different numbers and reporting systems here, so it's not important that you see the numbers. Just understand the concept here. And this is a measure of insulin resistance. So she's pre-diabetic, pre-hypertensive. Her vitamin D level is very, very low. Her vitamin B12 level is very low. And on pelvic ultrasound, she's got ovarian cysts. So am I going to stop there? No, we've got to do hormone profile, right, for a complete picture of this patient. So here's her hormone profile. Her, can you all see this over here? Do you want me to pull the podium back or you, you got it? Okay. Her estradiol is normal. Her progesterone is extremely low. This is very, very low for a 32-year-old. And then that ratio, remember the graph I showed you looking at the ratio, which is so important? The ratio is very low of her progesterone to estrogen. And then look at her androgens. They're too high. Her testosterone is high and her DHEAS is high. And then her cortisol, this is her stress hormone pattern. It's really not too bad. Uh, starts out okay in the morning, drops, comes up a little bit in the evening and then down. But we see this elevation uh, in the evening in women with children in the home. Because what are they doing at 4 or 5 in the afternoon? They're starting their second shift. We call it the double day. So they get up in the morning, you know, they go to the office, they go to the school, they, they go to work, and then they get the kids and they start the cooking and the cleaning and the uh, softball, soccer, voice, guitar, going to church, PTA meeting, getting dinner, uh, pets, orthodontist, dentist, um, birthday presents, wedding gifts, baby shower, I mean, you know how that goes. And then, you know, finally get to fall in bed. So this is where she's starting her second shift. Okay, so how am I going to treat this patient? Am I going to give her prim pro? Am I going to say stay on your birth control pills for this? Absolutely not. I'm going to give her the hormone that she needs, and that's progesterone. And then, of course, uh, she needs thyroid support. She needs vitamin D, vitamin B12. And your compounding pharmacist can do all of this for you. And I talked with her about diet and lifestyle changes. One of the first lifestyle changes I'll do with a patient is have them get a pedometer. How many of y'all have a pedometer? Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I was at a PharmaSave yesterday, and I saw that they have the walking programs. And I will typically have my patients start with 4,500 steps a day. Now, that's not effective for weight loss, but that is effective for mood, according to the Cooper Institute. And then we're going to gradually increase that. But when she looks down at 6 o'clock at night and her pedometer says 1,700, she's got a long way to go before bedtime, right? And women can take advantage. So even when they're running their kids around, they can get out, walk around the parking lot, walk around the soccer field instead of sitting in their car and talking on their cell phone or, or doing their nails. I mean, I, I know. But if you push yourself, you look at the pedometer, you're going to move more. You're going to take those opportunities, take the stairs at work, park further out in the parking lots when you're running your errands. And then I want her eating a Mediterranean diet. Eating this type of uh, diet has been shown to be protective against cancer and against cardiovascular disease. And it's affordable, easy, and practical to eat this way. And I have resources in my book as it relates to websites for this, and you can also get this information from the pharmacist. Now, I am from Texas, which is the home of the National Cattlemen's Association. And, yep, uh, red meat is up there at the top of the pyramid to be consumed very, very infrequently. I would say practically in Texas, 
if I get my patients to red meat two or three times a week, that's good. And that's what we do. Try to do bison, you know, hormone-free, antibiotic-free bison for the red meat, I think is preferable. Okay, also, I may not get a woman to change for herself, but she will change for kids. I've never met a mother that doesn't want her kids to succeed academically, socially, emotionally, spiritually. And we have research studies showing that eating out four times a week will increase a child's cardiovascular disease risk. This was presented at American Heart a couple of years ago. They looked at second graders, fourth graders, fifth graders, eighth graders, and 11th graders. They measured cholesterol factors, insulin factors, and they found that the kids that ate out four or more times a week already had biomarker changes putting them at risk. And eating out included eating school lunches, school breakfasts. The other factor that's important is eating at home at least five meals a week has been shown to be protective and conducive to self-esteem building, to better academic performance, to less substance use and abuse in teenagers. So I know that she's going to eat better if she eats at home, but how am I going to motivate her to do that? It's hard. I know it's hard. Uh, you got to have a crock pot. you got to have a bread machine. you got to have an ice chest, at least in East Texas where it's so hot, so that when the kids, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, Mom, you know, you just unzip it and you start throwing food back there. you got your carrot sticks. you got your bottled water, so you don't fall into that trap of having to pull into, you know, a fast food place and eat something devoid of micronutrients. And I can't tell you how nice it is when you program your bread machine and your crock pot to walk in that door after a hard day at work and have those aromas and know that all you got to do is make the salad and set the table. And you can make your kids do that. Right, Brennan? <laughs> okay. Uh, this is another way of introducing positive relationships with food. Does anybody here have an arrow garden? You do. What are you growing? Everything. What are you growing? Okay. What are you growing? Tomatoes, great. So you, you, can, you don't even have to get all dirty and messy and deal with the birds and the squirrels and the rabbits. You can grow in your kitchen, on your countertop, on your desk at work. And I want the PharmaSave selling arrow gardens. Georgia, you need to make a note of that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I got the stainless steel model because this matches my kitchen. But the bio lights are up here, and here's your little seed pods, and it tells you when you have to water it. This is my 16-year-old daughter getting our garden started. And this is after four weeks. This is growing uh, tomatoes and peppers. And it's just really delightful. And you can get the kids participating in this. This is great for the classroom, for teachers to be doing. Okay, so not only do I prescribe progesterone, but I also prescribe movies for my patients. A couple of years ago, I started prescribing films as an affordable, accessible, practical therapy to help my patients better understand their intimate relationships, beliefs, and interactions with the outer world. And uh, so this is a movie that I worked on with Paramount Pictures called Leap of Faith with Steve Martin, Liam Neeson, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Deborah Winger. And if you catch me at lunch, I can tell you some movie stories. But uh, I have a whole chapter in my book on cinema therapy if you're interested in some of my movie lists. So, uh, oh, I forgot, I don't have the movie. I guess it's in here somewhere. Well, the movie I recommended for this patient was Super Size Me because I wanted her to understand that eating the fast food was se severely detrimental. And another fast food movie is Fast Food Nation. Now, these are not movies for kids, okay? They're for the moms. I, I was speaking at a conference, and a few months later, a lady came up, and she said, Dr. Stevens, I just want to talk to you about your movie prescriptions. She said, I rented that movie, and it has some very foul language in it and wasn't appropriate for my kids. And I said, no, no, these are for the grown-ups. These are educational tools for my patients. Okay. So she comes back. She's got some lifting of fatigue, improvement in sleep, decrease in joint pain. Her menses is uh, every 32 to 38 days no side effects. You can see her thyroid functions are looking better. Her blood sugar has come way down. Her insulin resistance has improved, and uh, she's feeling better. Um, here she is at 12 months. 
feels better, more energy, less pain. Her psoriasis improved now. We've got that waist circumference down to 37 inches, and her triglycerides are now 124, blood sugar now 95. I mean, these are fantastic results. This is without a statin. This is without metformin, glucophage, all that mess. This is progesterone, nutrition, lifestyle, getting her into a better level of health. So you can see here's her hormone profile. Estrogen is normal. Progesterone is in therapeutic range. We've got the ratio up. And by giving progesterone, we decrease those androgens so her testosterone and DHEAS are now normal and her cortisol rhythm looks good. Um, also, I prescribe yoga for my patients. I have a chapter in my book on yoga. We did a study on yoga for working women at our facility and published those results in 2004. This was just a once a week yoga intervention and we saw significant results. I, I do yoga every day, but you can get results with just going to a class once a week. And many of the women in our study were overweight or obese or deconditioned. And I know it's kind of hard to see. We also used video instruction. We didn't even have a live instructor because university accused me of using a state facility for the practice of the Hindu religion when I wanted to do the study. So I had a battle there, but I won the battle and uh, published the study. Okay, so you're going to hear a lot more about yoga and how it helps with heart and lung and musculoskeletal problems in women. Okay, let's go to another case history. We just have 15 minutes. John gave me the sign. Okay. She's uh, 65 years old. She's got hot flashes, headaches, vaginal dryness, mood issues, weight gain, cognitive changes, increased joint pain, poor sleep, food cravings, night sweats. You know any 65-year-olds that have anything like that? Okay, so um, I'm often asked, well, how old is too old to have a hormone evaluation? There's no upper limit. The oldest patient I've ever prescribed hormones for was 92. And, you know, she came in for a visit. She was dressed to go to the Valentine's dance. Her legs were fantastic, and she was wearing a beautiful red dress and red pumps, and who am I to judge uh, her um, judgment as it relates to what model of care she wants at age 92? So I think women are living longer. If we go back 100 years ago, the average life expectancy was 49. Now it's 84. And so a woman will live nearly half her life after menopause because the average age of menopause has not changed in several hundred years. Average age of menopause is 50. So we've got to address this. And by doing so, we may be able to minimize or prevent age-related diseases of heart disease, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, diabetes, insulin resistance, cancer, and dementia. So her BMI is normal waist circumference normal, she's got hormone-related symptoms, and her triglycerides and inflammatory factors are high, and her blood sugar is high. And she's on a couple of prescription meds. Um, at this visit, she said her parents were in good health. She's been retired a couple of years, lives with her husband. She's already exercising five or six hours a week, only watching seven hours of TV a week. Excellent. Uh, she says, I've got some decreased stamina on review of systems. So look at her hormone profile. Estrogen, non-detectable. Even with the saliva, which is very sensitive in the low analyte ranges, there's just not even enough there to measure. Her progesterone, less than 15, very, very low. Ratio, very low. Pro testosterone, low. DHEAS, low. Her cortisol circadian rhythm is, is not too bad. This is normal along the green line here. So what it, does she need? Well, I'm going to start with estrogen and progesterone. Because of the promiscuity of the hormones, some of them can be converted from estrogen to testosterone or from progesterone to cortisol. So uh, I'm going to see how things settle down. And so she comes back, she's got improvement in most symptoms, but she still has a lot of musculoskeletal pain. She's also had a recent stressor of her uh, father's death. And you can see that her hormone-related symptoms got better. Uh, we saw improvement on her lipids and her, her inflammatory factors and her glucose at eight weeks. So let's look at her hormone profile. Well, she's at goal range with her estrogen and her progesterone. Her testosterone is just is slightly improved the DHEAS is still stayed down there. So at this point, she's on estrogen progesterone. I'm going to add 
DHEA. And her blood pressure is getting lower, so we're going to start uh, weaning her off of her blood pressure medicine. She doesn't need it anymore. So here's her follow-up. We've now got everything in goal range, uh, but the testosterone has, has declined again. So at this visit, I'm going to go ahead and add testosterone. So some of my patients are on all of those hormones. They need all of those hormones. They have documentation of low endogenous levels and symptoms related to that. So at 36 months, she comes back. She feels balanced. Her stamina, mood, and pain are improved. She has occasional hot flashes, but says these are stress-related. She's uh, decreased uh, her body weight and her waistline just a little bit to what she feels is normal for her, and her inflammatory factors and glucose are at goal range. And this is showing her follow-up hormone profile. So we're always following up. We're making sure we're at goal. This uh, last case study, so we'll have time for questions. So she's 59. She's got sarcoidosis, which is a, a chronic uh, inflammatory lung disease and cardiovascular disease, referred by her lung doctor for uh, hormone-related symptoms. She went through natural menopause at age 49, took HRT for a few years, but stopped because of worries about risk. So now she's got severe hot flashes and sweating both daytime and nighttime. When she's at home, she puts her head in the freezer to cool off. A lot of my patients do that. Um, her former physician has told her that she has nursing home vagina. Now, I don't care you know, what you see or what's going on, but there's no woman that wants to be told she's got a nursing home vagina. And uh, she's got low energy, reduced stamina, severe stress, cognitive changes, uh, decreased libido, and what she calls loss of emotions since she started taking antidepressants five years ago. You know, she stopped the hormones, so they gave her antidepressants. Okay, so she's on quite a few prescription drugs up here. Uh, she takes oxygen at night. Uh, then she's, she's had stents because she had a heart attack and they put in a stent a couple of years ago. Uh, eight pregnancies, six deliveries, breastfed all six children. And looking at her family history, her mom had menopause at age 45. She also had diabetes and heart disease and her mom died of a stroke last year. Dad has diabetes, sister with breast cancer, aunt with breast cancer, grandmother with breast cancer. On review systems, she's having chest pain. Her cardiologist has said, don't worry about it. Your stress test is okay. She's having palpitations, dyspnea. She's got hair loss on her lower extremities and pubis. And she's got pain, of course, with uh, sexual intercourse. On her social history, she's been in her marriage for 41 years. Uh, currently, her 86-year-old father, who she moved in with her after her mom died, and her 25-year-old disabled son and her husband are in the household, one dog. She's cooking for three men, three hot meals a day. She's working full-time as a bookkeeper in a factory, also volunteering 12 hours a week, no tobacco or alcohol use. Now, I don't think any woman should be cooking three hot meals a day, unless that's her job and she's getting paid for it. You can teach a man to make a sandwich, ask my husband. Okay, so on physical exam, you can see that uh, she's on the bubble with her waist circumference at 35 inches. She definitely has changes uh, with atrophic changes in the vulva and, and vaginal area, hormone-related symptoms, and high inflammation, low vitamin D. But am I stopping there? No, I need to know her hormone profile so that I can adequately treat her and assist her. And look at her estrogen. It's extremely low. Her progesterone is extremely low. The ratio is extremely low. Her testosterone is low normal. DHES is way down there. But look at her cortisol. That looks good. She's okay throughout the day on her cortisol. And you say, how is that possible? This woman is doing so many things. Well, I'll tell you in just a minute. So uh, when we look at stress in women and strain, we measure something called job strain and home strain. And strain is emotional demands versus potential for controls. And women in the U.S. that have the highest job strain are nurses and teachers. They have high emotional demands, low potential for control. 
Women in the home that have the highest home strain are mothers of toddlers. And I think back to when my kids were toddlers. I know one of them, uh, if we, I was trying to get everybody out the door in the morning and you know get to the office to see patients and I would tie her shoes too tight, she would cry too tight. So I would untie them, tie them again, too loose, too loose. You know, we would go through the too tight, too loose, you know, with a two and a half year old. And I felt so incompetent, I could not wait to get to the office and take care of a patient that I knew that I could do that pretty well. Then we know that women with chronic illness are very prone to problems with their cortisol, circadian rhythms, with their stress hormone. But that can be buffered by social support. And this question, how many people can you rely on to help with your children, pets, household, or transportation needs? Zero to one, two to five, six or greater. If a woman answers six or greater, she's likely to have a normal cortisol circadian rhythm, even in the face of a high social burden. And who is she likely to get that social support from? Other women. So we do have to reveal our burdens, and we do have to ask for help, and we have to be gracious and receive help. And this is a mistake that a lot of my patients make. They, they try to be too tough and do too much, and people offer help, but they're not specific in, in asking for it and receiving it. So I, I would encourage that. So she answered six or greater. That's why her cortisol rhythm looks good. She's got a lot of support. And so this is what I'm going to give her. I'm going to give her estrogen, progesterone, and DHEA. I'm going to give her an estriol vaginal cream. The compounding pharmacist makes this. And of course, she needs some supplements. And then I actually wrote this on a prescription pad. Stop cooking three meals a day. OK. So um, let's see. We're going to move forward. Uh, so she comes back, she's got significant improvement in her symptoms, lifting of fatigue, less pain, uh, improved stamina, no pain with sex. She's doing yoga twice a week. She loves the yoga. She's cooking two meals a day or sometimes just one evening meal per day. And she wants to stop her antidepressants. So at this visit, um, you can see things have gotten better as far as that waistline and her hormone-related symptom scores and the inflammation. And so uh, her hormone levels look good. We're at goal range. So we'll start weaning her off of that antidepressant. And I not only do cinema therapy with my patients, I do bibliotherapy. I recommend books. A Woman's Worth by Marianne Williamson was a book that I recommended. Anybody familiar with that one? Yeah, great, isn't it? And uh, so in the case studies in my book, I have the movies, I have the prescriptions, I have the hormone profiles, and I have the bibliotherapy. Okay, this is a great question. It's on, is there, a risk of pro, uh, is there a risk of breast cancer with using the natural progesterone? No, there, there's no evidence that progesterone increases breast cancer risk. In fact, the epidemiological evidence shows that it decreases breast cancer risk. Now, Provera, Primpro, absolutely increases breast cancer risk actually causes breast cancer, in my clinical opinion, based on the post-WHI data, there is causality with Provera in breast cancer. But there's a very large study called the E3N cohort that's looking at this. And I'm very comfortable in using progesterone in my patients. And I, I do not think there's any evidence that shows there's an increased breast cancer risk with progesterone, with the natural progesterone. I'm, I use it myself, I have a strong family history of breast cancer, and like you saw in the case histories, I, because of what the data says, I'm comfortable. Okay, is this our, one more question? Two more questions. Okay, Sylvie. All right. Well, thank you for uh, your compliments. I, 
I appreciate you, your interest in the book and your comments. Uh, yes, saliva testing is not just for perimenopause and menopausal women. There are so many applications of this type of evaluation. I learned about saliva testing at the National Institutes of Health when I was a medical student. It has been used at the NIH since the 1960s. It's a very accurate measure. Again, you've got to be choosy about your lab. You, I have my patients tear the things out of magazines and say, oh, well, see, Dr. Stevens, it's only $52. Can I get my saliva test here? And I'm like, no, you may not because I've got to be confident that there are quality control issues in place and I'm going to get a, a, an accurate laboratory assay. So some of the applications that I use in children and teenagers would be for learning disorders, for mood disorders, uh, for hormone disorders, um, seizure disorders, asthma, uh, acne, all of those I would test uh, uh, pre-pubertal or pubertal male or female and there are reference ranges established for those ages and then I do see males in my practice certainly not as many males as females but uh, certainly test men it's extremely important if they have a family history of cardiovascular disease or prostate cancer or personal comorbidity that you know what's going on with their not just testosterone but also progesterone I use progesterone in men. It has an antihypertensive effect. It has an analgesic effect. Um, there are some studies with IV progesterone at Emory University being used for acute brain trauma. And it's being used in Iraq right now, IV progesterone in males and females for acute brain trauma. So uh, sure, you can test the guys and you need to you need to get your guys hormonally balanced as well, and there are reference ranges for them. Now, I don't have much success with the four-tube kit on the teenagers. Um, you know, to get a 16-year-old girl to do anything is pretty rough, but um, if mommy takes the tube in there when she wakes her up in the morning and then sets the alarm and says, okay, you can't eat or drink anything, you know, two hours before bedtime and takes the tube in there again to collect it. I mean, mommy has to do all the work and get it shipped usually, unless the teenager's really motivated. Uh, so I usually can only get a two-tube test in a teenager, but um, kids are being given drugs for things that really should be treated through nutritional lifestyle. The very low dose hormone supplement, I've had tremendous results as it relates to some of these disorders in, in kids and teenagers. Okay, so la last question. Okay, well, s tell me who, Sylvia. Who's the lucky winner? This one right here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, she's commenting about the saliva testing. If she's had blood testing and she's already on the bioidentical hormones, should she have saliva testing? I would do it. I, I think that it would be prudent to do it because, again, you want to know what's happening at the tissue level. And I didn't even get into so much data as it relates to cortisol DHEA ratios and, and all of these other important things uh, in women's health. So I would still have it. Now, in the U.S., the saliva testing is covered by Medicare, Medicaid, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, a lot of our insurances. But the, the problem in the U.S. is a lot of my patients can't afford insurance or their employer doesn't provide insurance. So the patients are paying out of pocket for it, but I have not found a patient who could not figure out some way to budget for it because it is, it's such important information for her personal health. It's an investment in her that's gonna benefit her husband, her children, her uh, work environment if she is feeling better and hormonally balanced. I even had a patient in Arizona that lived in her car. This is how impoverished she was, but she, she wouldn't take charity and she paid for the saliva test because she was educated. Even though she was impoverished, she was educated and she understood the power of an accurate hormone assessment. So, you know, maybe there can be a, an effort among women in Canada to say we want more elegant, appropriate testing intervention for us as we face the perimenopausal menopausal transition. I mean, a group of determined women can do amazing things. And I appreciate your invitation to move to Nova Scotia. Talk to my husband about that. And I thank you for your attention.